everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode eight of season six of the Revise and Resubmit podcast. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. Now, normally, you would be hearing from my co-host, Dr. Annalisa Boland, right now, reminding you of who she is, what she does, but she's on her way to Spain as I record this, where she'll be meeting up with me, today's guest, and several others from our CNIS community at the International Association for Communication and Sport Conference in Barcelona, Spain. Very exciting. I'm not there yet. She's on her way. Um, But more to report on all of that. So it's on me to record this intro, which means no questions, unless I really go down a rabbit hole and ask myself a rhetorical question of some sort. I don't think anybody wants that. However, in today's episode, we're catching up with another former guest in our What's New With series. And I know I say this every single time, but again, today's episode is so much fun. Dr. Keenan Brown, an associate professor in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations, actually gave us an answer to one question that we had never heard before. We always ask our guests, what did you want to be when the young Keenan wanted to grow up? He gives us a really fun answer, but I'm not going to spoil it. You're going to have to tune in. When we last caught up with Dr. Brown, and I have to say, this was like two and a half years ago, very early into the podcast. He might have been episode three, episode four. Uh, We were in the height of the pandemic and the height of lockdown, and he was doing a lot of research on athletes and image repair. Because let's be honest, there's always one or two who just aren't making the best decisions. But today, he tells us about how his research has shifted just a little bit to focus on the why and the how of audience perceptions about athletes. What traits are most important in helping us identify more and resonate more with specific athletes? We talk about all of this, we talk about sports, we kind of touch on the things that we talked about two and a half years ago, and he breaks it all down for us. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Keenan Brown to the podcast. Joining us today in our What's New With series, we cannot wait to hear all about what you've been doing in more than two years since we last talked to you. I, yeah, that, uh, I remember being one of the first uh, guests, like for the first season of the podcast, and I appreciated that you uh, wanted me to be one of the first people you interviewed. So, I man, I'm excited to kind of talk about what I've done since then. So, yeah, thanks for having me. So, as a very quick reminder to our listeners, when we last caught up with Keenan, now literally more than two and a half years ago, um, you talked to us during episode four, season one, for anyone that wants to check that out. But we were in the middle of a major lockdown because of COVID-19. Everyone was working from home. And we had very little live sporting events going on. So I remember that we had all joked at the time that we were desperate for something, anything to watch. And we were like, (laughs) we're watching Bundesliga, Formula One, just to have something to watch. But I know a lot has happened for you since that time. And we cannot wait to hear all about it. Great. Great. Keenan, we have a couple of no thinking question sections for you. So we'll start that out now. So okay. first thing is remind us where you're from. Uh, so born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I actually uh, spent nine years in Knoxville. I got my bachelor's and my master's at the University of Tennessee. Um, and I got my doctorate from the University of Alabama. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, hired full time by uh, the Department of Ad and PR. So I've been here um, for about 14, 13, 14 years total. Okay, so Keenan, before we really get into the research and what you do now, um, what did the young Keenan want to be when he grew up? Did you always know that you wanted to be a professor and be in academia? All right, so great question because uh, I don't really get to talk about this a lot. So I actually Excellent. wanted to be a basketball. 
Yeah, uh, like I actually wanted to be a basketball player when I was growing up. Um, wanted to go to the NBA. Realized that I was going to stop growing in seventh grade. I pretty much hit my peak then. Uh, I went from one of the tallest people in my uh, grade to one of the shortest. So I realized that dream was was ending. So then I got really involved in music. Like I've always been, like sports is a passion of mine, but honestly, my my first passion and my strongest passion will always be music. Um, taught myself how to play, play uh, piano by ear. Uh, I was a marching band from seventh grade up until college. I did like five years in, uh, in undergrad at Tennessee in the marching band. Um, so I actually went to college wanting to be a band director um initially so i actually like i majored in music education um for one reason or another decided not to pursue that um so then i just kind of fell into pr and that's how i got into branding which led to me getting into academia which is kind of where where i am now that's a fun answer i don't think we've ever heard band director before we do get a lot of nba nfl professional sports and so i love this one what did you play in the march? So, so, so I'm a brass head. So my primary instrument was trumpet. Um, so I, you know, mainly played that in concert band. But I marched with a baritone. So, if, like, if you know, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's it's basically kind of a smaller tuba uh, that is designed to march with. Uh, so, since we didn't have that many. Um, baritone players in the marching band or really in band period i'm usually marched with that and i played uh trumpet and concert band but i'm a brass head i know how to play trombone i know how to play tuba so yeah okay so wh- why are you not marching up and down the hallways with the trumpet or band? <laughs> i mean that would liven things up right <laughs> Well, well, one because I haven't. I don't think I've picked up a horn in <laughs> maybe maybe twenty years, maybe if that. Uh, but it's like somewhere between fifteen and twenty years, I haven't touched the instrument um, in that long. Uh, and two, also, I'm old, so I don't know if I, if my knees work well <laughs> enough to actually march up and down the hallway like I used to anymore. Um, but I do miss it. I do miss it a lot. Um, I keep up with a lot of my friends that I was in marching band with it, both in high school and in college. Um, you know, every now and then we'll, we'll reminisce about the, the wild and crazy times. Um, if you, if you ever watched American Pie, like the whole one time in band <laughs> camp, like montage, a lot of that crap is true. <laughs> I love that. I, I mean, love it. I was like, you to like herald in the next faculty meeting <laughs> I, I might go buy a horn just for that to happen i was about to say if you if you actually take the time to buy a trumpet i will i will dust off my <laughs> mouthpiece and warm it up and and see if i can can still play like i used to for sure you, you don't put that past me <laughs> <laughs> no i, be, I, look, I believe great. you i know you well enough <laughs> <laughs> okay you give us an elevator pitch on where your research is today. Wow. Okay. So, so it's, so it's crazy because when I think we first talked, um, I was still very deep into um, my research with image repair and I still work a lot on uh, looking at image and reputation, but I actually look at it from a different angle now. So I've started to kind of look at how our identity shaped the way that we perceive and evaluate athlete and really just, you know, celebrity image. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how does race, how does gender, how does political affiliation, how does sexual orientation, how does, um, you know, regionality, how does fandom, just like how all of these aspects of our identity, you know, impact the way that we view an athlete you know whether they're doing something wrong or whether they're just kind of being a voice for their you know sport whether they are contributing to charity just kind of how does this shape the perception that we have of athletes and sprint and teams okay well i'm glad you said that because now i've got 30 questions for you oh me okay. too. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's kick this off you're are you looking at the the fan or the athlete themselves or both so honestly both so i i try to take into account 
uh, both the identity of the athlete and that, that they are presenting. So really kind of more about self-presentation on their end, but also um, more deeply kind of rooted in social identity theory. I'm looking at the identity of the audience member of the fan um, and kind of how that identity shapes the way that they're perceiving the athlete. And I, and I try to do it in a way where I'm looking at competing elements of their identity. So, you know, like a lot of the work that I've seen um, previously only kind of looks at one element. Like they, it only looks at race or it only looks at sexual orientation. You have a few intersectionality studies that kind of look at race and gender, and that's typically the avenue that they go. Um, but, you know, I, I just recently um, put, had a study accepted to International Journal of Sports Communication that is looking at how NBA fanship and political affiliation kind of interacts to, to figure out how an audience member is going to perceive the social justice movement that or the social justice advocacy that the NBA did during the bubble when they you know painted the course in Black Lives Matter logos mm -hmm. and they allowed mm -hmm. uh, slogans and they allowed uh, players to wear different social justice messages on the back of their jerseys and I just wanted to kind of see okay if you were a hardcore NBA fan but you know you're a Republican mm -hmm. how do you perceive you know, this, this element of the NBA's, uh, you know, social ju justice campaigns. Okay. So you've been talking about these different kind of demographic factors uh, in the studies that you've done up to this point, are you finding that one is a stronger predictor or yeah, so, so with that particular study, it's actually interesting because what I found was that for for Democrats, um, political affiliation mattered more than fanship. So whether they were a fan of the NBA or not, it seemed that they were, you know, they thought positively of the NBA and what they were doing. For Republicans, fanship mattered more. So if they were, you know, more of a fan of the NBA, then they actually saw the initiatives more positively than um, if they weren't fans of the NBA. So, you know, political identity really had a stronger impact on Democrats, whereas fanship really had more of an impact on um, Republicans. All right. So here's a question. Can identity change? Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, no, that's that's a good question. <laughs> that, is, that is something that I'm that I'm really interested in. I have no clue yet how to study that, but I've always been interested in again, let, going back to the NBA thing. Okay, let's say you are a Republican, you've been a Trump supporter this entire time, whatever, like anti Black Lives Matter, you know, however, you know, you you want to take that, and you know, you see what's going on in the bubble. You see the players that you love supporting this. Like, does that you know, sway you to have a change of heart. And I, and I would be interested, I think it would probably end up taking more qualitative means, mm. but I would be interested in kind of finding out, okay, if you are someone whose views change because of sports or because of an athlete, kind of, you know, what were the underlying reasons behind that? Okay, so I have another follow-up question. You had mentioned sports fandom, and what I'm wondering is we've got kind of overall, I love all sports. I love to watch sports. You have fandom in that sense. But then you have like super fans, people, you know, that are Alabama roll tide all the way. And so it's team specific and maybe even sport specific. So when you're looking at fandom, is it at a more general level or, for example, you know, if you are not an NBA fan per se, but like sports, how does that all, how does that all play in? So, so I've actually looked at it in various studies at all three levels. And what I mean by is just kind of the sport level where, okay, are you an NBA fan? 
the team level where, okay, are you a, you know, I'm a Memphis Grizzlies fan. So, you know, like, you know, the degree to how much you are a Grizzlies fan or a Bulls fan or a, you know, Lakers fan or whatever. And then particularly for the NBA, more so than a lot of other sports, I kind of look at it at the player level. So like, are you a LeBron fan? Are you a, you know, a John Morant fan and so forth. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's fascinating because I've found like a number of different things. Like to, at the sport level, I've seen that hardcore sport fandom really re- resides more on the collegiate side than the professional side. Like if you're a college mm-hmm. football fan, then you're not necessarily an NFL fan. If you are a college basketball fan, then you are not necessarily a an NBA fan. And I actually see it more on the basketball side than the football side where a lot of people that are hardcore college basketball fans hate the NBA, oh. whereas, yeah, yeah, <laughs> whereas a lot of NBA fans love them both. I mean, they, they see the NBA as the more superior product, which, like, <laughs> let's be real, it is. Uh, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, they do appreciate the, you know, the uniqueness and the talent that is at the college basketball level. Uh, you don't really see that on the collegiate side. Like, if you are a college sports fan, rarely are you also a professional sports fan. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one thing I've seen. Um, it also, in terms of team versus player fandom, also um, deviates by sport. So with NBA, you actually see a lot more people that are fans of players rather than teams. Um, and I and I think that I mean I, and that checks out because I mean I, I think well myself growing up um, I wasn't necessarily a Sixers fan as much as I was an Allen Iverson fan mm-hmm. so really wherever Allen Iverson went you know towards the end of his career you know that's the team that I watched the most like I've always been a Grizzlies fan since they've been in Memphis um, in terms of team but yeah like I've I've looked at. Um, you know, different players. I mean, for, I grew up watching Jordan and then AI is really the person that kind of shaped my um, my NBA fandom, um, which is the reason why I actually devoted, and I'll talk about it in a second, the book that I wrote, I can devote a chapter to kind of looking at his career um, and then became a Mello fan and now more of kind of a Westbrook, you know, John Morant fan. So I've, I've bounced from player to player. You see that more in the NBA than you actually see in you know, like the NFL, where it is kind of more, I don't want to say more team oriented, but it's, you know, it's not the superstar league Mm -hmm. that an NBA or like a major league baseball is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one of the things I'm kind of curious about, because you were talking about how we view athletes, and it could be like in a good context, they haven't had any major screw ups or, you know, publicly done bad things what I'm wondering is when you look at really since the last time we talked to you and probably backing up just a little bit more if you throw in kind of the social issues that we've all been dealing with but I think it's really been um experienced and kind of played out in unique ways by athletes and sports teams are you finding or have you found that our level of fandom, the way that we perceive athletes, like if you have an athlete that was very vocal about Black Lives Matter, um, is that something that increased our perceptions or improved our perception of the athlete or not so much? Okay, so one of the things that I want to kind of look at moving forward is kind of coming up with a model of reputation management. Um, And because I'm kind of curious about the same thing, Uh, you know, a lot of the work that I've done um, throughout my academic career has really kind of focused on image repair, you know, like if you screw up, what are the steps that you take? What are the things that you have to say? What are the things that you do? Um, you know, to try to repair your reputation. Um, And, you know, one of the things that I've never really took into consideration is the fact that there are positive actions that you can take um, that can also impact, you know, your reputation as well. So what what I'm interested in doing kind of kind of post, hopefully, you know, post promotion is 
look at building a model of reputation management where I think where I kind of look at, okay, so what are the factors that come into play for fans or for audience members that you need to take into account for why they evaluate a an athlete or a celebrity's reputation the way that they do. So you know, like are there internal factors, are there external noises, external voices and things? What are you know, like just what are the elements, what are the variables that come into play when you are evaluating someone's image? And then how does that evaluation play a role in your behavioral intentions? How much you talk, mm-hmm. you know, talk about them? Are you talking about them negatively or positively? Um, so it would kind of fall into what you're saying that, okay, if I look at it that way, okay, let's say an athlete is very vocal about Black Lives Matter, or you have an athlete that um, donates, you know, a lot of money and, and you know, advocates for LGBTQ plus issues. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like, are uh, that again, that can have just as significant of an impact on someone's image as, let's say, someone that gets in trouble, gets a DUI, you know, gets arrested or whatever. So, you know, are there, you know, factors in terms of a person's identity that comes into play there? Are there factors in terms of their experiences, you know, similar experience? Are there like social norms that we have to take into consideration? Or, you know, is there, like elements to media consumption and things like that that you have to take into consideration. So I really want to kind of do a, like a mixed methods, you know, approach over the next couple of years that really kind of looks at this from a grounded theory, more qualitative approach that leads into kind of building a model of, you know, celebrity reputation or celebrity, a model of celebrity image management. Okay. I've got a, I, question here oh, i've got about 17 questions but <laughs> here and so thinking about identity and like you said you g- growing up you you were a fan of the team where you were living mm-hmm. ha- when it comes to reputation management have you looked at how these teams are like go going for, I don't want to say going for youngsters, but like creating that sense of identity and, and getting you like roping you in at a young age, does that go into the like long, the long game of reputation management? Yeah. So, so that actually kind of gets into some of the studies that I've read that are related to more brand management, more, Mm -hmm. more branding, like basically how do you, how do you build lifelong fans? Well, you treat a team as a brand. Mm-hmm. If you think about, you know, if you think about some of the brands that that you still are loyal to, um, you know, you probably, you know, have certain restaurants that you like to eat at. You probably have certain um, clothing stores that you like to shop at. You probably have certain types of, you know, certain brands of foods that, okay, if you want a certain cheese, like you're going to get this particular kind. Uh, you know, if, you know, there might be a certain type of whiskey, a certain type of beer, a certain type of wine, you know, like that, you know, that brand loyalty. And it happens at a, you know, a younger age to kind of cultivate that brand loyalty over, you know, years or even decades. You're starting to see that teams are starting to realize that approaching their teams as brands um, are it, that you know that approach is actually more impactful and kind of looking at a way that you can cultivate those fans from a younger age as customers, you know, lifelong customers. They're realizing that these are the people that you know purchase season tickets. These are the people that are going to you know purchase them, you know, the NBA packages so they can watch their games. You know, these are the people that, you know, you know, when it comes to playoff games and things like that, they're the ones that are going to go out their way to spend the extra money to actually, you know, you know, get their butts in the seats. So, you know, cultivating those relationships over time, you're starting to see a lot more teams and honestly a lot more leagues kind of move more towards that kind of integrated marketing communications like relationship building approach to um to, you know to promotion mm. okay so um several minutes ago maybe a long time ago you had referenced a book <laughs> yes yes i can so that that is actually the thing that i've been working on um during the time that that you know this time in between my last podcast that I did with you and now. Um, so for the last couple of years, I was writing a book with 
uh, two former uh, classmates of mine that are still just two of my best friends um, in this field. Mia Long Anderson, uh, who is at Sam Houston State, and Josh Dickhouse, who is at uh, Bradley University. Um, fun fact with both of them, they were actually uh, co-authors with me on the first um, journal article that I ever published uh, back wow. in, my, in the PhD program. So we've been working together. They were a year ahead of me in the program. Um, you know, kind of took me under their wing, really kind of showed me the ropes. I really kind of looked up to them in the program as I was coming up. Um, so I've been working with them, honestly, ever, ever since. And we decided, we always talked about writing a book together. Um, and like, you know, the three of us finally sat down and said, okay, you know, th this is the right time. Josh and I were, we had sabbaticals coming up. Um, Mia was kind of getting more into administration, but she wanted to keep her toe, you know, you know, into the research side of things. Uh, so we were like, all right, let's, let's write this book. So what we decided to do is we wanted to write a book that was fun. So we <laughs> wanted to kind of look at um, the role of sports in American society. And we really wanted to kind of write a book that showed the different touch points that sports has on American culture. Uh, so, you know, we looked at things like uh, one chapter that Josh wrote was looking at the 1958 NFL championship game and kind of how that game not only kind of cemented the dominance of the NFL as, you know, like the top sport in America, but it also, you know, had a few innovations in terms of the way that we watch televised sports now. It, that really kind of stemmed from, you know, that championship game. Mm -hmm. uh, Mia wrote a chapter on um, Colin Kaepernick and Donald Trump and just kind of like that, like head to head battle, um, you know, during the time when Colin Kaepernick was, you know, like kind of standing up for police oppression and taking a knee during games and just kind of the back, you know, the, the fallout and the backlash from all of that. Um, I wrote a chapter, I mentioned this uh, earlier, but I wrote a chapter about Allen Iverson. I wrote a chapter about the parallels between Allen Iverson and Jay-Z's career and kind of how those parallels illustrated the intersection between hip hop culture and the NBA and how like basically those two things are so intertwined now that you can't really think about one without at least kind of referencing the other. So, you know, different, you know, different approaches to how sports impacts, you know, social political issues, how it impacts, you know, pop culture, how it impacts, um, you know, just different elements of, um, you know, the historical relevance of America and just kind of how sports really became a microcosm of American history. Um, so the approach to, um, we, we kind of took a case study approach to writing the book. We didn't want to just write, you know, one book that just kind of focused on one chapter. We really wanted to kind of, you know, focus on all of these different touch points because we felt like it would be a bigger illustration of how sports really is a microcosm of American culture and society. Okay, so as you were writing the book, did you have to, mm -hmm. this is a process question, did you have to like mm -hmm. cut several ideas for chapters? And or is there a part two coming like, already in the work? <laughs> <laughs> so so we we've talked about several ways that we could, you know, possibly um kind of create a part two. We thought we've talked about like possibly doing an edited book where we have other people um kind of you know submit chapters that they would be interested in saying that are kind of along the same lines. Because the, there are, you know, people that have read the book or people that we're covering a lot more like well hey this is great but you didn't really cover this or you didn't really cover that you know you can't cover everything you know and mm -hmm. and you know just right. um in one book uh but there are a lot of ideas that we would have loved to see kind of come to fruition that yeah, talk about the book. So we've, we've talked about doing an edited book. We've talked about possibly doing a podcast. We've talked about like different like multimedia options for this. Um, so, I mean, there's different avenues that we're kind of looking at um, in terms of the process. So we actually kind of looked at this through the lens of, um, of framing theory and kind of looked at how the media shaped the conversation 
around these particular topics. So a lot of the sources that we use were more primary sources, like, you know, news articles, feature stories in magazines, um, you know, news broadcasts, you know, from ESPN and other networks, uh, just to kind of shape how the media was really kind of, you know, shaping the perception of uh, the people that we were talking about. Keenan, good job. Um, I feel like we have many other follow-ups, and this is going to lead to many more conversations, but I'm not sad about that. Um, We are (laughs) at the point of the podcast where we get to ask you some fun questions, and you can give some of our listeners recommendations about what to watch, what to listen to, what to read, and all that sort of stuff. So, what television show are you watching right now, or what's your favorite television show? Um, so the show that I'm watching right now is slowly becoming one of my favorite shows and it's Abbott Elementary. Um, yes, <laughs> it is incredible. It, it is so, it has an office vibe, but it's mm-hmm. also very, it's also very unique in its approach. Like it's not, it's not just another office ripoff. Um, which I love, but it, you know, like it still has like the look and the feel and the camera like orientation and just the vibe of the office. Um, and I love workplace comedies like that. So it's, mm-hmm. it's just kind of looking, looking into, um, you know, the heart of, you know, the teachers at this elementary school, uh, this public elementary school. I mean, it just, it, again, growing up in Memphis, it brings back a lot of memories about, <laughs> some of the positives but also some of the challenges of you know being in an urban you know public school system um so that that is that's the show that i'm paying attention to now um another show that i'm watching and i've watched it ever since season one because uh because my girls love it is uh the mass singer so it's on its either eighth or ninth season right now um it's you know every wednesday night we sit down and we watch it so it's you know it's one of those traditions that i have with them but uh i'd say those are probably the two shows that i'm watching regularly that are new now i still have like my background shows that i watch when i'm writing and when i'm working or things like that so like classic shows like that 70s show Mm -hmm. um uh, you're the worst on fx is probably one of the shows that i love um love to kind of put on the background it's one of my favorite sitcoms happy endings which was like a three season show on abc a lot of people don't know about it but if you if you don't know about it go check it out it was kind of before its time it's on hulu It's it's a great sitcom Love it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. What book are you reading and or that we have to read? Oh, um, so I actually, I'm not reading a book right now that I want to recommend just because I haven't. <laughs> this, uh, like, well, I, well, I'm saying, I'm saying that because I, I've kind of gotten into this place where I'm trying to clear everything off my plate. So I'm not reading anything for fun I hear right you. now. I yeah, <laughs> but mm-hmm. there there are there are a couple of books that um, my colleague and friend, you know, our friend Andy Billings, he gave me a couple of recommendations for books that I need to start reading over the summer when I take a break. Um, so I'm definitely going to get on board. So next time you talk to me, hopefully I'll have a recommendation or two <laughs> um, about that. Okay, what is a movie that we absolutely need to see? Ooh, a movie. So. So the movie that I am planning on watching on my way to Barcelona next week for um, mm-hmm. for the International <laughs> Association for Common <laughs> Sport Conference um, is Megan, I don't, and it's the, it's the the kind of horror suspense movie about the the doll that becomes like the companion for this little girl. And I saw <laughs> I saw the previews for this movie all last fall, and I was like, okay, I I have to go watch this. And I'm like, I'm a fan of those types of movies. You can tell that most of the crap that I watch and read and stuff, like I'm so unserious when it comes to like my free time. Um, but yes, like I've been obsessed with the previews and just the premise of the movie. So that that is what I'm going to watch on my way to uh, Barcelona on that nine hour flight to Europe. OK, Don't... so we'll follow up on yeah. uh, what, yes. what you thought about this movie and yeah, what your seatmates thought as well. That... <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm excited about it because everybody that I've talked to that has already watched it has said that it is that it's so much better than I actually thought it was going to be. Like I I knew it was probably going to be kind of cheesy but and or whatever, but I still wanted to see it. Um but I yeah, I have a lot of friends that said that I'm going to be pleasantly surprised um about it. Okay, last question is mm-hmm. if your life were 
or if you were going to be on a reality show of your choice, what reality show would your life be or would you just want to be on? Uh, I can't wait. You know, to <laughs> let, like, okay, when I was growing up, I was obsessed with the real world. And I, I mean, I feel like the real world really symbolizes kind of like early Gen X millennial culture. So like, I feel like that would be the show that if I had to be on any reality show, like I would love to go on the real world. I mean, I I think they could do that. 20, 20, 30 years. I mean, 30 years, 20 years later. I'm saying you're not old, Keenan. I'm old. (laughs) What are you all talking about? I'm old. (laughs) Together and do a real world so I feel like something Annalisa and I have spoken about Keenan is turning Mm -hmm. um, our lovely CNIS into a bit of a reality show and it can be kind of Abbott Elementary esque with maybe a little bit of real world and all the other things and we think this would be a major point of entertainment for everyone I I, I mean Personally, I think it's already pretty much of a reality show. So all we need is some cameras going up and down the hallway, and I think it would be brilliant. Like I think the jokes were right itself. Cam- cameras and your trombone going up and down the hallway. That's right. There you go. There you go. Reality show in the making. We'll reach out to Netflix. Love it. Keenan, it has been so wonderful catching up with you. Thank you so much for joining us again in the What's New with series. And um, we're going to have you back on the podcast soon. Thank you. Great. I always, always enjoy talking to you both. Uh, always enjoy being on the podcast. And yeah, hopefully I'll have um, some great updates for you next time we, t- we, uh, we talk. Perfect. Great. All right. Thank